Remember when we couldn't even fathom how to say Mike Krzyzewski's name? Of course, in more than four decades, we've seen him move from a relative unknown to arguably the greatest men's college basketball coach of all time. 47 years in coaching, 42 of them at Duke, and five years coaching at West Point, where the Army Code of Honor became the basis of his entire life. This is We Need to Talk with Mike Krzyzewski. One of the things is about first like do you get tired of all the listening to all the firsts that no i mean i'll repeat this again i always say you know nobody landed on normandy by himself this past november on veterans day i was honored to be a guest on mike krzyzewski's podcast leslie's been a great friend for me and uh over the years so it's an honor to have you on and uh yeah it do you like being called a pioneer well, you know how West Point is who you are? Um, being a writer is who I am. He'll always be linked to the Blue Devils, but the core of the man was solidified by his years at the U.S. Military Academy, playing for Bob Knight. I sat down with Mike in his office, which is overwhelming, kind of like a museum, to talk about how everything he's become began at West Point. You know what, I never dreamed of going to West Point. I was recruited by Coach Knight in the spring of my senior year of high school. And I, I was a very good player. I was an all-state player and I had scholarship offers. Probably would have gone to Creighton. Oh, uh, I thought DePaul. No. You could chuck it up for no. Coach Meyer. Yeah. No, okay, Creighton. And, and, but you were gonna chuck it up, right? You were a shooter. I was a shooter, a scorer. A scorer, oh, score. my, my a, bad. A scorer, and, but I could pass too. But uh, when West Point came in, my parents who were an eighth grade education and a, you know, for my mom and my dad, a sophomore in high school, and uh, a son and daughter of immigrants. You know, their, their parents came from Krakow. And here, I have a chance to go, what, what they would say to me, you, you have a chance to go where presidents went to school. And I said, well, that's cool, but I'm not, I don't want to be president. I want to be Paul Silas. Yeah, I want to be, I want to be a, a really good player, but they hammered. I said no to Coach Knight first, but uh, it wasn't easy to say it to my parents because for two weeks they browbeat me, and finally I said I'll go. And uh, it was I call it the best decision I never made. You know they made it for me, but it showed how much that you know in that generation you trusted and loved your parents and didn't want to disappoint them and. Uh, it's really because of their steadfast commitment to making me do it uh, that I not only went, but that I stayed, you know, that I didn't leave. Because there are many times people who go to West Point think of leaving, quitting, because it's so tough. Do you just go around your whole life yelling, beat Navy? You know what? This is an interesting thing. I would get all the plebs in my company. I said, don't ever say that to me. When you do that, say beat everybody. Because if you learn to beat everybody, then you'll beat Navy easier. You know, even here at Duke, when we beat Carolina one year and they put bumper stickers, and I, I had them, I said, only have bumper stickers if we win a championship. What is the experience of the long gray line? Like, what, what do you do? Well, as soon as you said it, I got chills and, uh, uh, the long gray line is really uh, connected by our oath. And an oath is when you give your word. And each graduate gives its, his or her word for a lifetime of service to their country, whether it's in the military or in the civilian sector. And so it unifies the line. Obviously, you have class loyalty, you know, best of the line, 69. Uh, really, the core values that we have in our program are very similar to the core values of the, of the Army. And, you know, up the core values that we have in our program are, you know, one, integrity. You do what's right. Uh, respect. Everyone in your unit is important. Know, know that. Courage. The ability to confront at the moment it needs to be, something needs to be confronted. You ride for your brand, your duty loyalty, allegiance to your unit, and, tr and trust. 
In the mid-60s, Mike left the northwest side of Chicago, where he'd been the leading scorer in the Chicago Catholic League, to play for a young Bob Knight at Army. To Mike's surprise, he became a defensive specialist, always guarding the opponent's best shooter. He excelled in the classroom and on the court, but he couldn't graduate unless he cleared one major hurdle. One of the worst days of my life was my second day at West Point, and they do you go to a, a pool that's seven feet across. I said, where's the shell? I didn't say anything. <laughs> you weren't allowed to say anything. And they give you a rubber, at least they did at that time, a rubber, 10 pound rubber brick. And they said, swim as far, and I said, sir, I can't swim. And, and jump in. So I went down, the brick went down. I think they brought the brick up before me. <laughs> and uh, I was in rock squad swimming for uh, an entire year. And, uh, What's that called? Rock Squad, because oh, the rock. Oh, that's go. what they call it, okay. And you know, three time, at least three times a week at 7 in the morning, you're in a pool with about 30 other guys, you know, hugging the side. And, and I can still remember the guy, uh, Mr. Sarge, uh, say, remember, men, there are no walls in the ocean. And we would look at each other. Listen, we're in the Army. That's right. You we're, know, <laughs> we're ground patrol. We are. I'm staying on the darn ground. <laughs> But uh, you finally pass it by jumping off of a platform 20, 25 feet up, blindfolded in full gear. And you have to get out of, you know, like get your gear, get to the side. It's called survival swimming. Do you tell your players this, that Sometimes. blindfolded, off, pushed yeah, off because, a tower? Yeah, not push, you jump. Oh, you jump? Yeah, by you that willingly time. willingly do that? <laughs> yeah, but at West Point, I learned that failure was not your destination, and and uh, it's part of the process. To me, that's one of the great lessons that people should learn. <laughs> it, you know, you're not born with these values. You, uh, you if, if you're lucky enough, you're from a family that has it, or you go to school. You you learn it by living it, seeing it, but also sometimes by making a mistake. In and, and then have it brought to your attention. You know, uh, the one thing that you know, sometimes is lost in this, in our society right now, is the ability to allow someone to make a mistake. And because if you're changing limits, you're, you're gonna make some mistakes. And in other words, you make mistakes along the way. That doesn't mean you're doing something bad, but you're learning the, those values. It's, and so don't cover up failure and, and whatever. It, it's there, it's gonna happen. However, when you get up, don't always get up alone. Get up and accept someone helping you up. In other words, the best way to get better is not, that's not the destination, but also to be on teams because a team can make you better because then you're using the attributes of all the people on the team and you're f trying to form them together and you go to the best of those as a group. And if you're just doing it alone, how do you learn about all these attributes that other people have? And to me, that's why I've loved being a leader, love forming teams. And as the leader, I also get better by the people who are on my team. They make me better in teaching them. You know, some of the talented kids and with the US team for 11 years, are you kidding me? You're not, you know, if you're a really good teacher, you learn from your students, you know, because they're of that generation or, and, and you know, they're curious. They look at things a little bit different. How do you look at things different as you get to be 50, 60, and now in the 70s? You can read books and all that, but the best way to do it is to interact. What did you learn from Bob Knight? A lot, and, you know, uh, you know Coach Knight, uh, was, was amazing in preparation. And I, I never experienced anyone as passionate uh, about his teaching and about winning. And, uh, and then, the, 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 you know, how to do the game, you know, the, to uh, learn the game. And as a result of that, you are also, like being with him, I was exposed uh, to some of the great, coaches, Mr. Iba, 
What yeah. about Al Labalbo? He is really underrated. He I is. Think, in the, no one ever mentions. It's always you and Bob Knight. But well, you didn't give me a chance to oh, mention. Oh, were you going to get to him? I was. I thought you were stopping at Iba. No, <laughs> uh, Coach Newell, and uh, really on this on the staff that uh, Coach Knight had at uh, West Point, uh, Coach Labalbo was really a guru in man-to-man -man defense. Ball, you man. Ball, you man. <laughs> I still use it. Really? That's... And being in that right. in that passing lane and uh, the double vision, ball and man. And by being with Coach Knight, you uh, you were around a lot, of, a lot of people. And obviously, uh, his relationships with some of the then veteran coaches in the, in the game. I remember one night I was uh, at a table with Coach Knight, Mr. Iba, and, and Coach Newell. And, and I'm, I'm not saying a darn word, I'm just listening. And by that time, I, I was uh, the head coach here and in my fourth year. And, uh, uh, and I got to know Mr. Iba and, and Coach Newell very well. And uh, during that dinner, Coach Knight was, you know, he's the head coach, he was asked to do a bunch of different things. And both of them said, you know, you have a chance to be a really good coach. And I said, oh, thank you. And, and they gave me a, a great bit of advice. And it really set me off in finding out who I should be as a coach instead of trying to be somebody who I already knew, whether it be Knight, New, or whatever. And they said, you're going to be good, but don't try to be like us. Don't be us. If there's something that we do that you think is good, do it. But then find your own path in, in do, doing that. And in other words, basically they were saying, you won't be really good unless you own it. On the world stage, Mike was a scout for Bob Knight's 1984 Olympic gold medal winning team and also an assistant on the legendary 92 Dream Team. In 2005, he was promoted to head coach of the U.S. national team, where his record was an astonishing 88 and 1, including three consecutive Olympic gold medals. And his military connections were always in the mix. Dwayne Wade once told me when you brought maybe a colonel, to speak? Actually, we brought the four-star general who was a colonel at that time, Bob Brown. Now, uh, we, when we tried to establish the USA culture, uh, we felt that in order to own it, you had to understand selfless service. And no one could express that better than a person in the military, especially a, a wounded person. And so Bob was uh, the head of a striker uh, uh, f force in, in Iraq and he brought three of his wounded veterans. And uh, Scotty Smiley, who was blind, uh, saving his striker unit from a car bomb, and, uh, and two uh, NCOs who had lost limbs. And uh, they, Bob was emotional in, in talking, but then when Scotty, I mean, it, Scotty spoke. Scotty and I are still great friends. He actually, uh, he spoke to our team. Our, Almost everyone in the room was crying. Yeah, that's what Dwayne said. And I said, we got them now. I know they can feel. I know my team can feel. And all three of these wounded veterans, wounded, they weren't veterans, so they were in the service. No excuses, and they wanted to serve again. Even that day, in practice, uh, Dwayne Wade was miked with Scotty. And he would be telling him during the during during the thing, and uh, and Dwayne has a, a deep heart. You know, he's he's a special guy, and a, a lot of those guys are just they just needed to have their heart tweaked there, like uh, like, and they did that day. That that was an that was. Is that a strong time. memory for you because those players? Well, um, that was the beginning of then we of our association with the military. And it really led to uh, Marty Dempsey, the chair of the Joint Chiefs, establishing a, an office with the NBA. And now every NBA team has a, you know, tr a veteran troops you know, that they, they uh, celebrate. And uh, Marty is now, he works for the NBA, but he's also chairman of USA Basketball. 
What, what do you feel you share? You're often invited by the military to speak to them. What, what do you share with them? Well, uh, just to reinforce one, our appreciation, uh, I think the main message, especially if you're talking to a unit that's going to deploy, uh, that uh, you, you know you're not going to play a home game, and uh, you don't want to play a home game. Well, we don't want them to play a home game, and we're lucky that we haven't had home games. And so, but when you serve, it is somebody's home, and they will be an extraordinary opponent because they'll be defending their home. Therefore, you as in your unit, you have to try to own what you do and your values at that high a level. And if, if you don't, you have a chance to be defeated, you know, because they're protecting their, their home. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and to understand that people do extraordinary things. They don't necessarily fight a certain way They'll do anything, anything. And so what you say, well, they wouldn't do that. Yes, they will. Who are the leaders that you studied and you thought um, that, that, person, that person impacts me? You know, there's not one like that where people ask, like, what book did you read? I observe people, squad leaders. Uh, you know, squad leaders, there are, if you have four squads or three to a, a company, uh, NCOs who were not officers, how they how they dealt with with situations, facial expressions, not just what they say, but you know, uh, a leader should be able to impact on how they act, how they look. Is Mike Shashevsky a people person? As he would say, come on, yes. One of his core philosophies is shared ownership, shared enthusiasm. And he doesn't just believe in showing strength, he's learned to show emotion, having clearly been encouraged by his wife, Mickey, and three daughters. But his sense of fun goes back to college, where he and some friends started, okay, picture this, a lip-syncing boy band. At that time, Motown was really big. You know, it was in the 60s. and uh, I'm a child of the 60s. Yeah, and so we even had a, a music group called Jimmy Pop Top and the Moon Glows. And, and uh, uh, what was your hit or your no, cover? No, we, we, we lip synced. To what? Uh, any Motown. Well, didn't you have a couple? No, I mean, whether it be The Temptations. Oh, uh, My Girl? I mean, what were yeah, your songs? Well, all of them. I mean, I hate to say one. Were you the lead singer? No, 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 I wasn't. You were a pip? A pip, <laughs> a miracle. I'd rather <laughs> be a miracle That's true. with Smokey than a... Actually, I wouldn't mind being a pip with Gladys Knight. Yeah, for Midnight Train to Georgia. For anything. The sad part of that, the guy who was Jimmy Pop Top was a guy named Jimmy Ford, who was one of the great, great guys there. And a couple years after graduation, he was killed in a helicopter crash. And uh, you get emotional about that. But uh, there's a bond there that's, that's developed. Unbreakable. Yeah, unbreakable, and you know you have each other's back. Does West Point come into your mind at some time every single day? Whether I think of West Point or not, I'm thinking about a value that was introduced or you know injected in me. But think about West Point too. It is it, you're taught that you need to be a lifelong learner. And there are going to be things that you have to deal with that are not planned because every day is different. Shots in. Two, two. I've loved being a leader. Ready? It's because of my incredible, insatiable desire of learning new things. Yes, we love curiosity. Eleanor Roosevelt said that is the greatest gift to have curiosity. And I have it. and especially in my game, and in people, uh, and in different generations, you know, because I've coached for almost 50 years, been a head coach for 47, and uh, how youngsters have changed, you know, and how you have to relate to them, and how our culture has changed, and therefore you have to change in order to be able to communicate with them. 
uh, that aspect of uh, my career has been the most fascinating, really. After 47 years, he'll step down. Coach K's career has been captivating, impossible to overstate. National championships, gold medals, World Cup gold, developing NBA players, and ultimately family. He's looking at this year, his last, as a celebration of all he's been a part of, leading two programs at two world-class universities. His impact, of course, stretches far beyond the court. Many of his former players say he changed their lives. With a passion to prepare, the passion to compete, and the desire to win. What you should be doing is going in here. I'm open over here. He's always believed in the dignity of work. Duty on our country and a lifetime of service. West Point is the foundation for me. West Point is the best decision I never made. <laughs>